By the way, the, the new way is uh, the bad way, amen. That's not the way of God, it's the way of the world. And that's an old way anyway, amen. Uh, take your Bibles if you're here, standing in the 3-9 of 2 Peter. 2 Peter 3-9, if you're able to stand. We're going to read one verse and uh, give a recap from last week, get you caught up and uh, go into the second part of uh, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. Amen. How many made a promise this week? Amen. Amen. All right. How many kept the promise that you made? Some of us did. Some of us didn't. Amen. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. Amen. Uh, Second Peter chapter three, verse nine. And uh, hopefully uh, you got had something to uh, think about from last week. And uh, last week we gave a lot of background information. Hopefully it didn't bombard you too much. Uh, but it's necessary to understand last week to go into today. Amen. Second Peter chapter three, verse nine. Let's read that together. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen. We should know that the Lord is never, ever anxious to uh, put on man destruction. He's never, he's never anxious to do that. He's always long suffering. He's always merciful. It's a character of God to be merciful, uh, to be long suffering. And the scoffers and the mockers here were really making fun of the promise that the Christians were holding on to. And uh, that's why Peter is writing this letter. So as we go into this a little bit more today, let God speak to your heart and guide you as to what he wants you to do with what we're reading today, because God is not slack on his promise. He's going to do what he said he's going to do. Amen. I know sometimes as parents, we are slack on our promise to giving the kids the, the <clears throat> discipline that they need. Amen. And uh, so they get worse and worse. Man is the same way. He gets worse and worse. Oftentimes, some do repent, but then some get worse and worse. And so God's going to deal with that in his time. Father, bless now this morning that we as Christians can be encouraged. Peter writing to Christians scattered abroad and uh, being faced with mockers and scoffers were really getting to the point where he had to remind them that you're not slack concerning your promise. And Lord, help us to be reminded of that as well as we go through the conflicts of the daily grind, as we go through the challenges of daily life, Lord, as we go through uh, medical and educational and so many occupational uh, woes and things that happen, that you're not slack concerning your promise. And Lord, you're waiting for more and more men to repent. But help us to be what we need to be to show them what you are going to do and what you will do. Work in our midst, work in our lives. If there's one lost without Christ today, help that man, woman, boy or girl to see their need. Well, thank you for what you've already done and what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. Uh, we already have looked at last week that many times we look at this type of a passage and uh, the Lord is not is something that we don't normally consider. We normally consider what the Lord is, amen? Uh, but in this passage, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. And the, the false prophets and the false teachers were here scoffing at Jesus' return. I'm sure you probably have heard or maybe you have relatives or friends at your workplace that have scoffed at Jesus' return. They say it's not going to happen. They say Christians have uh, this dream that Jesus is going to come again, but he is not. Well, they, they, the Bible says they willingly are ignorant of some obvious facts that are out there. And uh, you and I have to make sure that we hold to the promise of God. By the way, did Jesus Christ promise you that he'd save you? Yes. Are we holding on to that promise? Yes, we are. And so if Jesus said he'd save us and we're holding on to that promise, guess what? The other promises are true as well. And so we've got to hold on to those promises. And so uh, in the, the midst of the scoffers and the mockers and the false teachers that were here of Peter's day, he wanted the brethren to know that God's not behind on his timetable at all. He's not slack concerning his promise. He's going to do what he said he's going to do. Amen. Uh, and their defense, like ours, still is the word of God. Folks, I, I, I hate to tell you this. Amen. Uh, many people don't want to still rely upon the Bible. 
They want to rely on everything else out there, but the promise is in the Bible, not in any place else. Amen. And we have got to stand on the word of God. If God said it, that settles it. Amen. Folks say, well, if God said it, uh, I believe it and that sells it. No, whether you believe it or not, it's still settled. Amen. So whether you believe it or not, it's settled. And their defense then was this book. Guess what our defense is? This book. Amen. Times are a little different now. We're in the church age now. And uh, so some things have already been fulfilled. But he's writing to let them know that God has a timetable that he is not behind on. And by the way, when he's speaking here in verse number 10, he says, but the day of the Lord will come. We told you last week that the day of the Lord is one event comprised of two events. And I, I illustrate it like this. We have one year. And in one year, we have how many seasons? Four seasons. Four seasons. Different things happen in different seasons. Springtime brings rain. Things grow. Summer brings green. They blossom. Yeah. Fall, it kind of gets uh, falling away. December and all those cold months, it gets cold. Things go dormant. Spring comes right around again. It's one year. The rapture is the first event that will happen in the day of the Lord in verse number 10, the day of the Lord. Now, is it going to be as a thief in the night? Yes, it will be like a thief in the night. Amen. What happens with a thief? A thief comes to steal something and he doesn't want anybody to see him. Jesus Christ is not going to touch down at the rapture. He's going to be in the air, in the clouds. He's going to call us. We're going to meet him up there. According to Corinthians, we're going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye. That is very fast. Very fast. Amen. And then we meet the Lord in the air. That then brings on three and a half years where the Antichrist will be in charge. What's going to happen then? At the moment of the rapture, I don't know if you can fathom this and wrap your head around this. At the moment of the rapture, there will not be one saved person on planet Earth. Not one saved person. Every saved person will be raptured or snatched out of this world. Which is going to make it easy for the Antichrist to come on and present his agenda. We're already being bombarded by that. I told you all that last week with the things that we're being mandated to do. But with the Christians gone, that Christian influence gone, uh, the spirit of God dwelling in every believer being gone at your workplaces, at your school, in your sporting events, in politics, everywhere around the world. With the Christian influence gone, the Antichrist is going to come in with his agenda. And for three and a half years, people are going to buy into it. And then he's going to do the unthinkable at, the, at year three and a half. He's going to say, worship me as God. And guess what? The Jewish nation is going to say, ho, 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 we didn't plan on that. We've got one God. His name is Jehovah, Yahweh. We, we did not plan on this. And he's going to demand that they sacrifice for him. And he's going to defile the temple that will be rebuilt again with much of, much of his support. Uh, now, figure that one out. He's going to support the building of the temple. And then he's going to say, now worship me in it. Oh, yeah. And at that time, they're going to know that this is not right. Three and a half more years, he's going to persecute everyone that doesn't have the mark of the beast in their hand or their forehead. This is all after the rapture, after we're snatched out. All of this is going to happen. Natural disasters, you think we've got them now? You haven't seen anything yet. There's going to be so many disasters naturally happen. And Jesus said this, they will happen simultaneously around the world. We've always had natural disasters. But they will happen simultaneously around the world. Jesus uses a word called and, which is a conjunction, meaning this will happen and that will happen and this will happen and this will happen. All at the same time, God pouring his judgment on a world that forgot about him. Aren't you glad you're going to be raptured? Aren't you glad you're saved? Aren't you glad you won't be here to see that? Amen. We'll be in heaven with the marriage supper of the Lamb. We'll be up there getting our crowns, uh, casting them at Jesus' feet. We will be far away to come back at the day of the Lord. Second event. The second event. Which is the second event? The second coming or day of the Lord's conclusion when he physically does touch down on the earth at the Mount of Olives. Same location he prayed at before his crucifixion. <laughs> crucifixion. Amen. So Peter writing here in chapter 3 is writing to encourage the brethren, the beloved, to stick it out, letting them know 
Jesus Christ is coming again. We looked at last week the past promise criticized in verse number uh, three. Uh, notice that in verse one, uh, this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in both which I stir up your pure mind by way of remembrance. What is Peter saying? Remember what you've been taught already. Remember what you've been preached to about. That you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by who? The holy prophets. What did they prophesy about Jesus' return? Yeah. Uh, Zechariah did. Malachi did. Uh, Elijah did. Yeah. Uh, Jeremiah did. And many of the others, minor and major prophets did. He said, and of the commandments of us, the who? The apostles who did. Peter did. James did. Paul did. Amen. Amen. He says, uh, of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first that there shall come in the last days, who? Scoffers. I'm sure in your lifetime you've heard scoffers. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. By the way, let me go into true confession. Before I got saved, guess what I was? A scoffer. I mocked people that believed the Bible. I said it was written by man. I said that no one in their right mind would believe this book in its entirety. I said it's been changed down through the years, so how can you trust it? I scoffed at it, and I mocked at it, but in my heart of hearts, it was because I didn't understand it. And no one could give me an answer until it came down to the year of 1990. The guy by the name of Roderick Branch began to pierce through this old heart by the Holy Spirit's power. And Brother Duffy began to answer some of the questions that I had in my heart that I scoffed about and I mocked at. And the more he answered those questions, the closer I drew to him and the closer I drew to him and the more I wanted to know. But you know what I didn't want, ironically? I didn't want church. I had been in church all my life, and I saw the foolishness and the, the, the foolery that was going on there. And I said, that couldn't be what Jesus Christ is about. And he quickly told me, you don't need church, you need Jesus. I had lumped Jesus and the church together and said, they must be the same person. Now, the church is the bride of Christ. But oftentimes, things can happen in the church that Jesus Christ does not approve of. And so when you look at the church and you look at the Christians, Peter writing here saying, hey, you need to make sure that you're the type of person you need to be to help others believing in this promise. Notice what he says down there in verse 11. Seeing then, all, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Yes, sir. That's what we need to be. And so Rod Branch began to answer the questions of my heart. My scoffing started turning into inquisitiveness. And I started inquiring. And the more questions he answered, the more questions I asked. And the more questions he answered, the more questions I asked. Until it came down to the point where he said, you just need to come to church. And guess what? My wife convinced herself to go. And then I convinced myself to go because I didn't want her to talk about me. And we went. And then the Holy Spirit convinced us both that day that we both needed to be saved. Now, we both had religion. I was baptized as a kid. My wife went through catechism and had professed and, and said all the right things in the book. We, we looked at the catechism book after we got saved. It says everything that you need to say. But there was no faith coupled with that and no belief on the Lord Jesus Christ. It was just words. And so we got saved and my scoffing and my mocking turned. And guess what? Then I was faced with scoffers and mockers because of the book I believed. And praise God, I had questions, uh, answers to the questions that they had. Why? They were the same questions that I had. Mark her down. The same questions that you had, people have. And as you got those questions answered, you can answer people that have those questions. I remember going to Pastor Bennett. He said, brother, why do you ask so many questions? I said, Pastor Bennett, when people ask me, I want to be able to tell them what the Bible says. I said, I don't want them to say my preacher said. I don't want them to say what well, I said. I want to show them in the Bible what God said. 
And so we looked at the promise criticized. We got the scoffers in verse number three and uh, saying, where is the promise in verse number four? Notice that. Uh, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last day scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. And uh, Peter says this, for this they willingly are ignorant of. So the past promise criticized turns into the past promise being scrutinized, starting in verse number five. Uh, Peter says we need to scrutinize or examine what they're saying and give an answer. He says six, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. In other words, uh, the, the flood did come just like God said it would. And then down there in verse seven, but the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store uh, reserved into the fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. He said the same word that said destroy and flood from above and underneath, the same word is keeping it intact right now, and the same word's going to bring fire in the end. And so we go from the promise criticized to the promise scrutinized. And by the way, we went over some obvious promises that God gave to know that he is a good promise keeper. What is one of those? One of the first ones, he said, uh, sin would bring death. I, I, I like that one. Amen. When people like to give me a hard time, uh -huh. I, I like to go to two fail stops. One, I say, God said sin would bring death. I say, you go to cemetery, what's out there? Dead people. Dead people yeah. They say, well, well, cancer caused that and a car accident yeah. caused that. And this, I said, but before it, all that, God said that sin was going to bring death. I said, let me give you to my second fail stop. Man can't stop sinning. And that's why he keeps dying. Because God said the wages of sin is death. He said, the day ye eat of that fruit, ye shall surely die. They died physically. They died spiritually. Spiritually on the spot. Physically, they died years later. But guess what? Every man, woman, boy, and girl that is born into this world will one day die if they don't get caught up in the rapture. And so my two fail stops were that God said sin brings death. And there are people dead. And man can't stop sinning. That's why he dies. Amen. Hey, Jesus Christ, the only one that's different. He didn't sin. He voluntarily gave his life for your sins and my sins. Amen and hallelujah. Praise God. That's a thanksgiving right there. Amen. And so the promise of sin bringing death uh, was promised. It was fulfilled. The promise of the Messiah to cure death uh, was given and fulfilled. It was given to Eve even in the same passage area. The promise of the Messiah's birth was given and it was fulfilled at Christmas. Uh, the promise of his death, burial, and resurrection was given by the prophets and by Jesus himself. It was fulfilled that we call that Easter. The promise of Jesus' return was announced, and guess what? It will be fulfilled. And so as you look at the promises, and that's just major promises. You look at some of the other promises we looked at last week, and every promise God gave has been fulfilled thus far in some way, shape, fashion, or form. Let me let you know a secret. I firmly believe that the Antichrist is alive right now. I believe that. Look at what's happening in our world. Look at how more and more sin is being called into law. And the Antichrist's name is going to be called the man of sin, which means the man of lawlessness, which means there's going to be no law against anything. Anything goes. Wow. I firmly believe that he is alive right now. What is he waiting for? Take control. Why can't he take control right now? Because the Bible says the spirit of God won't let him. Because of the Christian influence worldwide. But take the Christian influence out and guess what? He's going to have access to every unsaved mind and unbridled heart to Christ. But will people still get saved during that time? Yeah, they will. But what's going to happen to them? They're going to get persecuted for their faith. They're going to get persecuted for helping the Jews. They're going to get beat up and down for not taking the mark of the beast. So it's good to be saved right now. And so we, we saw that uh, this long suffering of God down there in verse number nine, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, is for you and I to be what we need to be so that people can see the promises, understand the promises, and get saved before the day of the Lord. For you and I will be the rapture because after that we're not here no more. Amen. Amen. 
Which brings us to point number three, the promise realized. Verse eight, the promise realized or the past promise realized. Realize what God is doing. Peter writing here saying, now based upon what I told you about these criticizers, based upon what I told you about you needing to scrutinize what God has already done, let me allow you to realize what God is doing concerning the Lord's day. And first of all, he says, be aware of your teachings. Notice what he says. But beloved, be not, what's the word? Ignorant. What did he say in verse 5? For this they willingly are what? Ignorant of. He says, but you, brethren, don't be ignorant. You know this. I've told you this. I've counseled you on this. Amen. He said, beloved, be not ignorant. So he's saying here concerning the Lord's day, be aware of your teachings. Amen. And uh, by the way, with all the accusations of the false prophets and the teachers, you and I need to keep the scriptures close at hand to give people an answer from the Bible. Amen. Is it easy to give them our philosophy? It is. Is it easy to give our opinion? Yeah, it is. But guess what? My opinion is not going to save anybody. Right. My argument is not going to save anybody. You know what is going to make the difference? The Bible. Because the Spirit of God will use the Word of God to bring conviction because that's how I got convicted. With all my scoffing and mocking, Somebody used the Bible to convict my heart. Amen. By the way, we need spiritual vision, and Peter is getting them to the point to, to look ahead and to see that the promise is coming. Say, preacher, what are you talking about? Notice the form of see and look in these verses. Go to verse 11. Notice the first word says what? Seeing then that all these things shall be desired, what manner of persons ought ye to be? Come down to verse number 12. What's the word? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of the Lord. Notice verse 13. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, do what? Look for new heavens and a new earth. Notice verse 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye what? Look for such things. Amen. He says over and over again. Come down to verse 17. Ye therefore, beloved, what's the word? Seeing you know these things before, beware. Peter puts before them, hey, look, the promise is coming. You just need to look for it. You need to see it. You need to be aware of it. Christian, our salvation is nearer than we ever believed. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before, and it brings me closer to the rapture. Amen. Amen. Every day that passes by brings me one step closer, either to death, I'm going to meet the Lord, or in the rapture, I'm going to meet the Lord. Every day, Peter's saying, look for it, see it, it's coming, keep your eyes fixed on it. Don't worry about those scoffers, don't worry about those mockers, they are willingly ignorant of, but don't you be ignorant. You know this already. Christian, do we know it? We know it, but we forget it. We let the events of the world surround us and overwhelm us and, and get us in, in, inundated with woe and with worry. And we think, oh, I can't go another day. I can't go another day. We go to sleep and wake up and guess what? There's another day. There's another day. And every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. So Peter here, letting him know your focus should be on looking for the Lord's return and seeing it. You know, he says, uh, be aware of your teachings, but he says this, uh, be advised of God's timing. Notice what he says at the rest of that verse. Uh, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. God is not bound by time or time constraints like us. I remember way back when we were at the storefront, one of our young people was doing a, a, a story and they wanted to know what the life of a pastor was like. And they had me write down a timeline of what I do from the sun up to sundown. You know, and I had never done that before, you know, because my days vary. And so I, I said, okay, I'll give you an average day of the pastor, you know. So I put my little schedule down. I do this, do this, do this, blah, blah, blah. Go out and do this, go out and do this, come yeah. back and do this, help with this, help with this. And, this, 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 this. and I and boom, then I go back to bed. And I looked at the list and I thought, wow, that's quite a bit for one day. I didn't realize I did that much. And then I started thinking, what, yeah. what is an average day to God like? What is an average day to God like? It says, one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. I began thinking, God, what do you do on an average day? I know you got to put up with me all day, and that's a yeah. full time job right there. I know you got to put up with my wife. I mean, she's got to take, take care of me. I know you got to uh, watch over my kids all day. 
that's the job and a half. You should get overtime for that. And I thought about my church members. And I said, now you got Pastor White and his family. You got our deacons and their families. And, and you got Brother Duffy. He's a Green Bay fan. He, he needs overtime watching. Amen. And I just began to think of, Lord, how in the world? What do you do in one day? Not to mention the people in China, in Russia, in Africa, in India. And it began to dawn on me, God must be really busy. And guess what? He does it with ease. He does it with ease. He understands and knows what we're going through, each and every one of us. He knows our every thought, each and every one of us. It says he knows the hairs on our head or the lack thereof. Amen. He knows. And it began to dawn on me, man, an average day for me is nothing compared to the Lord. And so Peter says, hey, look, you need to be aware of your teachings. Don't be ignorant that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years. God's not on your timetable. Be aware, be advised of God's timing. It's not like yours. Amen. Think about it. If you wrote down what you do in one day, you would probably be shocked at what it was. You would be a shock. I'm talking about from sun up to sundown, amen. Some of you might be embarrassed because you waste time, amen. But uh, it would be amazing as to what happens. Moses, uh, Psalm 90 and verse 4 says this, Moses, For a thousand years are in thy sight uh, are but as yesterday when it is past and as a watch in the night. And so we, we've got the, the past promise realize. And so uh, Peter's wanting them to know concerning the Lord's day, be advised of God's timing, be aware of your teachings. But then he looks at this from this perspective concerning the Lord's ways. Notice verse nine, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, the Lord's ways. By the way, you and I as parents, I mentioned this, we can be slack on giving discipline to our children so much so that they already know we're bluffing. And so they don't actually do anything until you bluff the third or fourth time. They know when you're serious. They know when you're serious. Uh, my kids know, I, I, I joke with my kids all the time. When I'm serious, they know I'm serious. And Josh will say, Dad's serious. He's serious. They, they know. Hey, the, the Lord's ways need to be known. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. God's slackness is not forgetfulness. And that's what the scoffers and the mockers want to say. It's forgetfulness, even if there is a God. Hey, it's a timeliness, uh, Peter is saying. God's got a timetable, and he's not on man's timetable. He's on his own timetable. Then he says concerning the Lord, Lord's ways, the Lord is on his long-suffering timetable. Notice what he says. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering. The Lord is on his long-suffering timetable, not on man's timetable. Let me give you this. Are you glad God's long-suffering with you? Amen. God, in his judgment, could take you and I out after we sin the first time. The way you just sin is what? Yeah. So as soon as you sin, God could take you and I out. But you know what he does? He has mercy. He has long-suffering. He has what we don't have oftentimes patience. And the Lord is patient. And the Lord is good. And all the other attributes that are up here. But the Lord is able to take us out. And he would be righteous to do so. But he is merciful and he is long-suffering and he is good to us. And so he is with sinners. Why do we think that God should take sinners out and spare us? Don't you get that way? Lord, they sin. Kill them. Lord, they sin. They're not right. Deal with them. But be merciful to me. Hey, watch it. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. He said concerning the Lord's ways, uh, he is uh, not on man's timetable. He is on his long-suffering timetable. And the Lord is not willing that any should perish. Notice what it goes on to say. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise that some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to what? Repentance. Peter is saying the scoffers and the mockers can say what they want to say, but the fact of the matter is God's waiting for more of them to turn just like this old scoffer did, just like this old mocker did. God could have taken me out, but God was long-suffering with this old scoffer, with this old mocker, and now the book that I scoffed and mocked, I believe on, and I can go to the other mockers and the other scoffers and the other naysayers and say, look, God said 
God said. And you know one thing I always like to do with people? I was just like you. I scoffed at it too. I mocked at it too until I found out it was all true. And then I began to give them things that came true. This promise, that promise, this promise, this promise. And normally I give them promises that they can associate with. And guess what? I said, and guess what? The promise of his coming is coming again. And God is waiting for you to be saved. And he's not slack concerned. He's going to come. By the way, did every other promise come true? Thus far, they did. Israel went into captivity. They came out of captivity. They went to Babylon. They came out of Babylon. Medes, the Persians came. All these nations came. All these nations went. We're in the time of the Gentiles and the church age right now. And that's going to be ended as soon as the rapture happens. And I'll tell you what, it's going to get into the next time age, which is the tribulation age, which is not made for you and I. God in his grace is giving all mankind a chance to repent. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he what? Gave his only begotten son. Romans 10.13 puts it this way. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so Peter writes and says the past promise needs to be realized by you. What God is doing right now. He's waiting for that last sinner. He's waiting for that one to repent. Hey, just like in the days of Moses, he said, everybody from this age on 20 years old and up, you're going to die in the wilderness over the next 40 years. It came down to that one last person to die. And guess what? When that person died, they were allowed to go in the promised land. It's coming down to that one last person that Jesus Christ wants to get saved. They're going to get saved, and guess what? The rapture's going to happen. The trumpet's going to sound, and the dead in Christ is going to be raised first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with the Lord in the air and be there forevermore with the Lord. Amen. Hey, just waiting for that last one. Who is that last one? It could be in this auditorium. It could be an online listener. It could be next door to you. It could be one of your relatives. It could be someone in your own household. It could be someone in China. It could be someone in Russia. It could be a mass revival where thousands get saved. And the Lord said, that's it. Time's up. The promise is over. Man has had his time. My long suffering is up. I'm going to pour out my judgment on the world. But before I do, blow the trumpet, bring the brothers home. Oh, yeah. Amen. Amen. Then we come home and then the Antichrist says, just what I've been waiting for. This global disaster. Where did everybody go? I have an answer. UFOs. And we've all watched Marvel cinema. And we've got to prepare ourselves against the enemy. You give me your power. And I will make sure this never happens again. I don't know what argument he's going to use, but it's going to sound good. It's going to sound so good that all the nations are going to give him their power, including Israel. And remember, Israel and the United States house the most Jews, six million, uh, six million plus in Israel and six million in America. They give you a startling reality, and I've given you this before. America is not mentioned in the prophetic timetable. Hmm. Say, hey, preacher, why is America not listed in a prophetic timetable? I think we're going to be inconsequential. We're a power right now, but I think right now, the rate we're going, we're not going to be a superpower anymore. We owe China too much money. We're too much of a capitalistic society where everybody's trying to one-up someone to get money. And because it's all about money, you're not going to have the mark of the beast. You're not going to be able to sell, try, uh, uh, buy or sell or trade. Something's going to happen with that type of economy. And I think we're going to go down the tubes. That's just my own personal opinion. So we move down to verse number 10. We've already seen the past promise realized in verse uh, number 9 and 7 and 8. But now the past promise emphasized in verse number 10 concerning the Lord's day. Peter wanted them to realize what God is doing, but then emphasize what we should be doing. What does he say in verse 10 uh, in this emphasis? But the day of the Lord will come. He said, don't worry about the scoffers. Don't worry about the mockers. This day will come. Kids are already wor uh, worrying about Christmas. Thanksgiving ain't even came yet. Amen. One of our neighbors, they had Thanksgiving out for about, what, about a week. Christmas is out already. They took Thanksgiving and put it away. 
and bought out Christmas already. I like, at least let the day come. At least let the Thanksgiving turkey be eaten. At least let us have some ham and then get into the Christmas, at least. Now, I'm not talking about you if you've rushed the season already. Amen. I'm just bringing out a point, amen. My kids, I said, we normally put up our decorations after Thanksgiving. Our kids say, let's put it up the day before Thanksgiving. So after Thanksgiving, we don't have to do it. Amen. We'll have fat bellies and we don't want to do it on that day. Amen. <laughs> but I said, the past promise emphasized concerning the Lord's day. Peter wanted them to realize what God is doing, but then emphasizes what we should be doing. He said, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. And uh, by the way, uh, when the Lord Jesus Christ does touch down, it will be so unexpected. He said, at such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man coming. He's going to catch everybody by such surprise. They're going to be involved in their LGBTQT parades. They're going to be involved in all their lawlessness. Uh, this thing is going to be legal. This thing is going to be legal. Uh, all the gay marriage stuff is going to be there. It's going to be so much legalization of sin. And he is going to catch everybody by total surprise. Surprise. Do you not think that the waters flooding Pharaoh didn't catch Pharaoh by surprise? He saw the children of Israel go through that. We can do that. Yeah, get up, Neil. Ha, yeah, yeah. Then that water came down. Didn't see that coming. Didn't see that coming. They were in there in Jericho, all secure with the walls. They blew those trumpets. Guess what? The walls came down. They were like, didn't see that coming. Didn't see that coming. Moses uh, had the rod down there, and they threw their magical rods down there. Moses' serpent ate up the other ones. They were like, didn't see that coming. What am I saying? The birth, uh, not the birth, birth of the Lord, they didn't see that coming either. Amen. Uh, they were not looking for that. Amen. The rapture is going to take people by surprise just as much as the day of the Lord is going to catch people by surprise. Thief in the night. Thief in the night. Notice what it says. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with great noise. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. Now, folks, I don't know that much about science, but I know that involves some heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be what? Burned up. What was the promise? The promise was in verse number seven. The heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto what? Fire against what? The day of what? Judgment and perdition of who? Ungodly men. And then we come to verse 10. He says down there, it's going to be like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Peter said, it's a promise. It's going to happen don't worry about the scoffers that are criticizing. You just need to scrutinize the times and let me emphasize what is going to happen, what I am doing. I'm long suffering. And so now you need to be realizing what is at stake here. The souls of men, women, boys and girls are at stake. Don't worry about these scoffers. Don't worry about these mockers. You understand they're going to criticize. You just need to scrutinize. And you just need to realize what time it is. And God's not on our timetable. And so Peter now says, let me emphasize something to you. You need to know what type of person you ought to be. Amen. Notice verse 11. Seeing then that all these things should be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be? In all manner. Oh, it's what manner of persons ought ye to be. I read that wrong. What, per, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? The day of the Lord's going to come. And just think about what kind of day it will be. The Antichrist will be on the scene. The mark of the beast will have been given out. Lawlessness will be on the rise. Plagues will be on the rise. Christians will be persecuted. Jews will be slain. Christians will be slain. And with the scoffers harping on time, Peter, let's be loved brethren, know that the day of the Lord will catch them like a thief in the night. And so with the space of time that you have, knowing that a thousand years is as one day and one year is as a thousand, knowing that you have but a limited time space, you're not on God's time span where he's got limitless time. 
You have a limited time span. And he says, you need to know what manner of persons you ought to be so that you can warn other people because that day will come and it will catch them unawares. You're covered already by the blood. But many people aren't. And Peter begins to encourage them on what manner of people they ought to be. We're going to finish this up next week. Amen. We're going to talk about four things that we need to be in our manner. Amen. The words manner means the type of. Conversation there means behavior. Godliness means God-like character or conduct. Amen. And Peter says, let me emphasize your manner just for a moment of what you need to be like. I'm going to give you four points next week as to the manner of people that we need to be knowing that the scoffers are there. Knowing the criticizers are there. Knowing that we need to scrutinize. Knowing that we need to have some emphasis on what God is doing and realize we don't have a lot of time. We really don't have a lot of time. And so Peter begins to emphasize in verse 10 what manner of people they ought to be and the direction they should be looking. By the way, folks, we should keep our eyes up. You know what you don't see when you look up? You don't see what's going on around you. Now, I'm not talking about being oblivious to your surroundings. I'm talking about knowing that there's a promise that God's going to keep. Yeah. Knowing there is a rapture that's going to happen. Knowing that one day people are going to see you and the next day they're not. Knowing that these things that we see right now and that people see will be destroyed. Knowing there is a real antichrist that will take the scene. Knowing that you're the only Bible people will ever read. Knowing that you're the only real Christian that some people may ever see. What manner of persons ought you to be? And Peter challenges them and says, you know what? There's a type of mentality you should have. And I'll give that to you next week. But as we go out, I'm sure some of us already know what kind of type of person we need to be. Amen. We know we need to be Christ-like. We know we're going to have scoffers. We know we're going to have criticizers. We need to scrutinize, realize, emphasize the times, and say, okay, God, what type of person do you want me to be so that I can win that one, so that I can win that one? I still look at Brother Rod Branch's life as an unsaved person. Now, did he have flaws like everybody else? Yes, he did. But you know what? I didn't see one. You know what I saw? The word of God was in that man. And the answers that I needed, he had. I didn't, I didn't want to talk to anybody else because he had the answers. Do you know that God has made you that type of man, that type of woman? that type of boy, that type of girl, where you can impact one person and that person can get saved. You have that ability. You have that power. You have the spirit. Did you know that? The guy that witnessed to me, he didn't know that he was that person. It was just business as usual to him. I'll witness to whoever I can. And he fell upon a heart that was a scoffing heart, that was a mocking heart, but underneath it sincerely wanted to know, but was confused about what it had already heard. And it sincerely wanted to know. But since nobody could answer it, he just scoffed and he mocked. And all the while, the long suffering of God was ministered to me until February 3rd, 1991, this old scoffer this old mocker came to Calvary Baptist Church with his precious wife, sat right down there, heard the gospel, and got saved. And this scoffer, this mocker, turned into a believer and began to ask questions so he could answer any other scoffer and any other mocker about this book that he loves now and he cherishes now. Folks, think about the one person that maybe you can influence the one person that you can impact. Maybe it's a mother, maybe it's a father, maybe it's a sister, maybe it's a brother, maybe it's a child, maybe it's a daughter, maybe it's a son, maybe it's a parent, maybe it's a relative, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a coworker. But God has you on this planet to reach 
one person Amen. at a time. And when you reach that one, guess what? Go get another one. Yes, Go get another one. We're going to talk about those things next week. Yeah. Let's make sure that we recognize what manner of persons we ought to be. In the first manner, we, we ought to be soul conscious. Soul conscious. God has us there to impact one. Because we don't know who that one is. Don't be prejudiced. Give it to everybody. Amen. <laughs> Give it to everybody. That's right. And in time, you find out who that one or two or that three or four or five or 20 or 30 were Amen. after they get saved. I still have a love in my heart. Brother Dunn, I call him up all the time and uh, tell him, thank you for leading me to Christ. Amen. I was one that he impacted. I was one. Let's think about what manner of person we ought to be. Father, thank you for Peter's encouragement to the brethren scattered faced by these scoffers, faced by these mockers. And Peter writing to encourage them, don't worry about the criticism. Criticizers will do that, but you just need to make sure you scrutinize and realize and emphasize the times and be the man or person you ought to be. Lord, help us as we consider the man or person we ought to be. Lord, place that one or two or three on our hearts that we need to be conscious of and be the best witness that we can be to him or her or to them. And to have that manner of conversation that you would have us to have in Christ's likeness and godliness as we look for and hasten to the coming of the rapture. Thank you for loving us, Lord Minister. And this invitation in Jesus' name, amen. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed on looking around. If God's spoken to your heart about being saved, we want to help you today. But we can't help you if you don't acknowledge your need for Christ. If you're here today without Jesus Christ, and you say, if I died right now, I'm not sure I'd go to heaven. I want to pray for you. If you're unsure that if you died right this moment, because the rapture could happen, you say, preacher, I'm not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven but I'm concerned about it. Will you pray for me? Would you just right where you at, raise your hand up and I can acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. Preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. I, I'm concerned about it. I want to go, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really convinced. I'm not sure. But Christian, this is for you. What manner of person ought you to be then, being that you are saved? If you're viewing online, what person, type of person ought you to be online? Be that godly example. Be that Christ-like example to everyone that you see. And you'll be surprised the witness that God will give you. Father, bless now in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, and we're looking around as G2 plays the invitation. Right where you're at, you can bow and ask God to make you aware of the manner of person you ought to be. For some of you, maybe you already know. Maybe he wants you to be more forgiving. Maybe he wants you to be more kind. Maybe he wants you to be more loving. Maybe he wants you to be more understanding. Or maybe he wants you to be less judgmental. Or maybe he wants you to be more accepting. I see the world out there, they know what we should be like. They know what manner of persons we ought to be. They know if we call ourselves Christians, then we should be like Christ. And they will quickly tell you that when you behave in a way that's unchristlike, They will quickly call you a hypocrite if you're not careful. So ask God to make you that manner of person that you ought to be, that type of person you ought to be, in your behavior, in your godliness. And let it be seen in you. You never know, God will give you the chance to witness to that person, give them the gospel. And you may not be the one to lead them to Christ, but somebody else may. Rod Brand spent three months witnessing to me. I came to church and he was not the one to lead me to Christ. Brother Dunn was. You may do the planning. You may do the watering, but God's going to give the increase where he sees fit. Just as I am without one, one plea. That blood was shed for thee. Ask God to make you that person, that person.
Maybe it's to be less busy, more concerned about souls. Maybe less cumbered about with doing, more being, more kindness. The past promise emphasized the day of the Lord will come. And oh, what that day will be like. We may have friends left behind. We may have loved ones left behind. But let it not be because we didn't have the mentality to be the type of person God wanted us to be. Father, thank you for Peter and uh, his leading of the Spirit of God to challenge these brethren scattered abroad. And the first epistle, he had to charge them to continue to stand amidst the persecution. In this epistle, he had to charge them about the false prophets and the false teachers and the scoffers and the mockers in light of what they already knew as a promise. And they were willingly ignorant. But Peter says, uh, but don't you be ignorant. You know one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day. There's a span of time. Just be the type of persons that you ought to be and look for the return of the Lord. Father, help us to keep that spiritual vision. Help us to keep our eyesight on you. Keep our looks up and keep our love manward. And our, adore, uh, our affections and adoration to Almighty God. Thank you for loving us, Lord. Bless now those online that are viewing. Pray that there's one there that needs to be saved. They would contact us and let us know. They would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner and be gloriously born again, accepting the death of Christ for them, the burial of Christ and the resurrection of Christ for them, like we have. Then help us to leave here, Lord, differently than when we came in, more like Christ, so we can be the manner of persons that we ought to be. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.